Thank you for being here for this Black Hills Information Security webcast. We do these pretty much every week, sometimes two a week. Right now we're doing a training class at the same time and helping support DERPCON. It's a crazy day. But we have Tim Medin here from Red Siege Information Security. Tim is a, a great family. Like he's a part of the family, part of the Black Hills family. Uh, I've known Tim for years. Tim's fantastic. I asked him, hey, Tim, can I say that you were the creator of Curb Roasting? And he's like, yeah, I tell my kids they have to say that too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Tim is the creator of Curb Roasting in some way, like with other people, maybe. I don't know. He's going to share the story. But thanks for being here This on this Black Hills Information Security podcast. Webcast? Podcast? All right, now I'm out. Take it away, Tim. Cool. Well, thanks, Jason. Thank you all million people who have uh, showed up here. Again, ask questions along the way. They're, they're gonna they're, we got the, the lovely Black Hills people here who are gonna field some of those questions uh, and try to interject if something is a little bit uh, unclear, um, if they can't answer it directly or whatever it may be. So, anyways, who am I? Again, quick background: uh, Tim Medin. Uh, I have a company called Red Siege. Uh, I, I do consult the pen testing and red teaming and, and such. Also, uh, an author at Sans. So, I'm the lead author for the pen testing course 560. I also teach 660 Einz faculty, uh, the SANS master's program, program director and pen tester for a long time. Quick, one sh quick shout out to uh, Eric Van Bogenhout. So I, I, I used some graphics from a couple of Eric's slides. Uh, he's actually my co-author from 560. So we ripped out some of that content. So quick shout out to, uh, to him. Here is his contact info. He's over in, uh, in Europe, so he's probably not here. So really quick. What is Kerberos, right? The, the, the simple answer is, of course, if you, uh, is gonna be, it's going to be used for our Windows authentication. And there's three pieces. I actually got a nice Kerberos shirt from a friend of mine in Japan. It's a, a Japan-sized shirt. So it, I think it's like a 6X or a 7X. Uh, so it's a massive shirt for you know, that, that thinner society over there than what I am. But uh, Kerberos is what's used for our Windows authentication. The, the origin is, of course, Cerberos. It is the three-headed dog that guards the entrance to, to Hades, to, to the underworld, right? A lot of parallels there, right? The Windows domain is, is hell. I'm sure a lot of you are probably saying stuff like that. So with that, let's get into, let me pull this up over here real quick. Holy smokes, that Discord is flying. It's amazing. So the main authentication mechanism we're going to use inside of Windows Active Directory, inside of the Windows domain, is going to be, of course, Kerberos, right? And as we have the three-headed dog, there's actually three different pieces as part of Kerberos. Now, the key to Kerberos is, like, for example, I don't trust the server, and the server doesn't, definitely doesn't trust me, but we both trust an intermediary. That's the sort of three pieces. So we've got that KDC, the, the, the key distribution center. That should not say Kerberos. That is actually a, a typo. The key distribution center, key distribution server. Uh, there's a number of other sort of subservices there. That is the domain controller. Okay, so that's our KDC. I'm going to use the term KDC and DC. I'm going to use those interchangeably because that's, that KDC, that, that particular service, is part of the domain controller. And of course, we've got the client. This is the user who wants to authenticate to some sort of a service. And of course, we have the service, the web server, uh, the SQL server, uh, whatever it, it may be. So some of the keys here, the important pieces with Kerberos is to, to, to demonstrate trust, we're going to need to use some secrets. So uh, we're going to have these secret values. We'll come back and discuss that in a little bit more depth. But the key here is that secret. There is only really one secret in the domain, and that's going to be the NTLM hash. So the password hash for the account is used either directly as an encryption key or used to generate then an encryption key. The key here, it all comes back to that password hash. And frankly, in turn, you could say it comes back to that particular password. Right. So let's walk through some of the basics on how this works. Oh, oh my screen. There we go. So I like to walk through this and sort of uh, explain 
here's how you can explain it like uh, like, like I'm five, right? Let's break this down and make this super simple. How could I explain this to my kids, for example, right? Justin's going to be pasting a link here probably for uh, a great, it's a little bit more in depth, but it's a nice, simple breakdown on how Kerberos uh, work. So first off, I need to tell the domain controller that KDC, that I am me, right? I am Tim, and I'm going to prove it by, by typing in my password. My password here, as Riliki says, is spring 2020. Nailed it. You have to change that, right? So what happens here, and we'll go into the little bit more depth on exactly what's going on, but I'm going to prove that I am who I am by essentially using my, my password hash, right? So once that happens, I now get a ticket granting ticket. So I only need to prove myself sort of one time. This now allows me to request other tickets. You can sort of think of like this as, sort of the entry to the theme park, right? And I, I know, uh, you know Disney is closed, but this gets me into the park. I'm not going on any rides yet. This gets me into the park. So that's my ticket branding ticket here. So again, I'm gonna prove who I am. It's all gonna be based on my password hash. I then get that ticket granting ticket. Now, when I want to authenticate to an additional service, what I can do here, oops, my stop. My PowerPoint is freaking out. I mean, there we go. Uh, when I want to authenticate to a service, let's say I want to go on that ride. I need to present my ticket granting ticket now to the domain controller and say, hey, this is where I want to go. This is the ride that I want to go on now, right? This is the service I want to talk to. So I present that ticket granting ticket, and then I get in response a service ticket. That service ticket comes in two pieces, and we'll talk about those two pieces here in uh, just a little bit. So I present my ticket granting ticket. The domain controller here says, okay, cool, let's use this. And now I'm going to give you this ticket. Now, an important thing to remember here is the domain controller, the KDC, does not decide if I have permissions, right? If it did, imagine how big that domain controller would have to be, how big that KDC would have to be to store all of the different users and groups and all the different permissions for everything. So this just says, hey, this is who Tim is. And I'm gonna let the service decide, does Tim have access or, or not? So what happens, and as we mentioned, there's those two pieces of our ticket, right? Half of it's gonna be for me, half of it's going to be for the server. We can see that right here, right? There's two pieces. I keep half, I keep this coupon part, the other half now I'm going to send to that target service. The target service is then going to say, um, then make a decision as to whether I should have access or not and what level of access I should have. Right? Again, that's not the domain controller making that choice. That domain controller would have to be massive to pull that off. So instead, the server is going to make that decision itself by looking at what's called my path. Now, the pack, the Privileged Attribute Certificate, which I'll show you in just a, a minute here, this is sort of like my driver's license. It tells all sorts of things about me. This is Tim. Here's his uh, group memberships. Here's his user ID, uh, et cetera. Then just like on your driver's license, which has you know holograms and such, there's actually two signatures. And that server can then verify and say, hey, it, is one, it can verify one of those two signatures one of those two holograms, if you will, and say, okay, this pack is valid. Cool, let's uh, carry on. Sometimes, again, we'll come back to this a little while later, sometimes it's gonna say, you know what? I need a secondary check. And this pack looks good from my perspective, but I need a secondary check on another system. I need to say, hey, domain controller, can you double check? Uh, and there's very specific times when that's gonna happen. So here's what your pack looks like. You, there's a Microsoft link here we'll, we'll see in a minute. And it, it shows you how you could maybe look at your own pack. But if we start here off to the right, they're kind of backwards because of the, the sizing. But off to the right, we can see, for example, my account name. My account name is, is TM here. The full account name, login information, uh, et cetera, as well as my RID, 
That's the last part of the SID. That's called my relative ID. And we've got my group membership array. I clipped that off for the sake of space. But we would see a list of the groups of which I am a member. Further, at the very end of the pack, as we mentioned, are those two signatures. The first signature is signed using the key of the member services password hash, right? So that means, of course, that target service knows its own password and therefore its own pa password hash. And it can verify this first signature itself and say, hey, this is what I think it is, right? This, this signature checks out, I'm good. The second signature is gonna be signed with a key that only the domain controller has. And we'll come back to that in a, a little bit, uh, but a sort of a, a teaser there, that's gonna be signed with the password hash for KRB TGT. All right, so let's take a look. We talked about the two pieces of the, uh, the service ticket. So we got the two pieces of service ticket. I feel like I got a question here. What's up, CJ? Uh, real quick, what was PAC stand for? PAC is the Privilege Attribute Certificate right there at the top. And by the way, that is not a Bruin stri stripe around the room, Tiny Tim. That's a Packer stripe. You can see my, see my finger right there. There's my cheese head, so. Important. Cool. NTLM hash is the only secret. What about sign-ins with smart cards or hello for business credentials? Well, we'll come back to some of that. The guts of Kerberos still re rely on the, uh, this, this one particular sort of secret value. Now, if you have to do additional authentication, you could have it bounce off your pack. There's a number of sort of additional complexities here, and we don't have necessarily time to go through all of it. And then, uh, never mind. I guess I'll let you roll here. Yeah, so there's another question with the uh, the pack here. The pack is built on my user attributes. So if you add me to a group, when my pack is generated, of course, that's going to adjust that pack. This is essentially just a whole bunch of the user information about me, my AD account information, jammed into one place inside the ticket. I think Erica asked this question. Okay, cool. All right, so there's my service ticket. Remember, there are two pieces. There's the piece that I keep, and there's the piece that I send to the, uh, the remote system. The piece that I keep contains information about the validity time. When does this thing expire? So I don't use it after its exp expiration date. This is going to be encrypted with the TGT session key. So remember, when I first get access to the network, I say, hey, domain controller, can I get that ticket granting ticket? And then from there, there's a session key inside. That's how I'm gonna sort of essentially communicate with the, uh, the domain controller. Now the other half, we've got the path, right? That's my user information. We just talked about that path, right? This is the half that I'm gonna to send to the server. It also contains a session key. So that session key here allows me to, to have a, an established uh, cryptographic keys between me and that member server so we can talk securely and frankly we don't have to generate the key we're gonna um now this server portion the the key here an important piece and we're going to come back to this a little in a little while is it is encrypted using the service account password hash right so that's going to be important when we get to kerber roasting and some of the silver ticket attacks here in just a little bit now, you'll notice when this ticket is generated, as we mentioned, it's encrypted using the service account password hash. So what we need in a domain is we need a mapping between the service and the underlying service account. With that, we have an SPN. This is our service principal name. This is the mapping between, let's say I wanna go to a, a file share on my specific file server. Right? I need a mapping between the service on the host and the underlying account. So if I go to a mail server and I hit it with HTTP, that HTTP on that host goes together to build that name, it's mapped to an underlying account. And I'll show you a quick sort of picture of that in just a second. 
How do we establish that mapping? Well, we can use uh, set SPN. If we do it manually, some services will do that th themselves if you, um, if, you, if you set them and give them the correct permissions. So here's an example of some SPNs. Now, when I connect to a service, I don't know the underlying service account, right? But the domain controller has to have that. It has to have that so it can encrypt the ticket and use that encrypt, encrypt the ticket with the correct key. So here's a little table off to the, the, the bottom right here. Is I've got the mail service, the mail server, mail service rather, on Cliff. Get it? Great jokes. Let's see, uh, let's see, let's see Discord light up on that one. Nice. Thanks, BB, for loving my dad joke there. Old school dad joke too, right? So the mail, mail on Cliff. It's going to have a mapping to that mail service account on the background, right? And and of course that name, that that account name, is whatever it is defined by that organization. I could have Charlotte the web server, right? <laughs> Charlotte the web server, and there's going to be a mapping between the service HTTP, the the, the host to that underlying account. And then I'll have a SQL server on a uh, SQL service on DB01 mapped back to the uh, the SQL engine. <laughs> I see you guys are loving that joke, huh? Uh, Mega, or sorry, who was that? Paco, really, really brutal. All right, so right, that, that's the mapping between these pieces. Now let's talk through now some of those different long-term keys. So as we mentioned, we have those three pieces. Right, we've got the server, the target service, we've got the client, and then of course we've got the KDC. Each piece has its own long-term key. So the KDC's long-term key is the, the password hash of KRB TGT, right? So you've probably heard about that. If you've done anything with uh, golden tickets, something like that, you probably are familiar with this, this account. The client long-term key, well, that's pretty straightforward, right? That's my password hash. And then the target's long-term key is going to be the password hash of that underlying service, that of that target service. So here's what all of this sort of looks like. This is gonna be a little bit more complicated representation of how we, we do our, our, our authentication. So what happens is, I'm going to get a timestamp from the domain controller. Whoops, let me jump ahead here. With, I got these out of order. Uh, I'm going to get a timestamp from the, the, the um, KDC. I'm going to encrypt it using my password hash. And then I'm going to send it back. The KDC, because it knows my password hash, is then going to decrypt and confirm, hey, is this, is this actually valid? Right? At that point, I get my ticket granting ticket. So now I've got my ticket granting ticket, which allows me access to some of those other systems. Once I, to, to get access to those systems, as we mentioned before, I'm going to present my ticket granting ticket and I'll get the service ticket, right? And this is sort of a different representation of that same sort of information. Remember, the piece that I'm going to send to that member server, in this case, the file server, includes the pack, right? That pack it has information about me. There's actually a typo there, too. There should be a privileged attribute certificate, not account. My bad. So the pack validation. Now, this is important, right? When the, when the server gets that ticket, it can verify it itself, right? There, there's, there's sort of there's those two signatures we saw earlier. The first one it can check, it can look at that first signature and validate it itself. Now there's that second signature. That second signature, what has to happen is to validate that it has to be sent back to the KDC, sent back to the domain controller. If the service, that target service is set to run as part of the operating system, what happens then is that we won't, we won't get this second check. For the sake of speed, because it's obviously going to be slower to say, hey, you know what, can I get a second opinion over here? Hey, domain controller, can you check this out for me? That's, of course, going to be significantly slower. So for things like the database, your SQL server, will not, by default, perform that additional validation. 
So that'll be important for some of the, the silver tickets. Uh, things like web servers will always do the secondary check, and the reason it has to do with the, uh, the app pools and such. Okay. So now that is sort of the, the explanation of uh, Kerberos so far. I don't see any questions queuing up yet. So I think we're good. All right, let's let's talk now a little oh, no. bit. Oh, no, I got your questions here. All right, Huckleberry, let's roll. Where does Kerberos pre-auth come in? That was, where was that, right? There. Uh -huh. Right, so I, I, I'm going to get that ticket. It, essentially, the pre-auth gives me my ticket granting ticket. That's the short version of what that whole thing is. But without that, well, you, we would be sending around a lot more material that would be based on my password hash. If I'm sending around the ticket granting ticket, realistically, you're not going to crack that because that's encrypted with a, a randomly generated key instead of a crappy password that I may have. Where can they find the pack certificates? Where are those stored? Uh, the pack is going to be the pack is going to be in the ticket. So there's a Wireshark. Actually, when I did this, I actually let me let me pull up the pack here real quick. There's a Wireshark know, tutorial or link or whatever I forget what it was, but it talked you through importing the key and using that to decrypt the ticket, and then you can look inside this. This is actually a screenshot from Wireshark. So the, the Microsoft link we posted before, that will also give you the uh, the same thing. All right. So the NTL the NTLM hash is stored in memory when we authenticate. So if Kerberos depended on the NTLM, how is it better? So I don't. Sorry, I don't quite get that. All righty. Skip it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, 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 the nice thing with Kerberos is we can we can trust each other. So I trust the KDC. The other system can trust the KDC, and we can use that that trust. If I went direct, what I would have to do is the, the target system would somehow have to have access to a password hash or some way, uh, or some third way to, to check back with the, uh, the domain controller. I think that I'm answering that question. Okay. Is there any way for NTL, uh, any way for Linux clients to play in with the NTLM stuff? Absolutely. So the, the one of the big faults, and I, this was actually something I said or showed sort of at the beginning. The Microsoft Kerberos is actually a bastardization of the MIT Kerberos. So with MIT Kerberos, you're going to use a key tab file, and you're going to authenticate with a random value. Now, the big difference between MIT Kerberos and Microsoft Kerberos is MIT Kerberos, you generate a random key, and that's what you use to identify yourself. Now, of course, it's nothing that you're going to remember, which makes it a little bit less portable, but that's going to be sort of the, the big key here, no pun intended, is that key tab file. Similarly, with your target services, I can have a key tab file, I can import that key into Active Directory, and we could actually play from the, uh, the Linux side as well. My guess, that is Erica asking that question, right? That was Erica, yeah, you nailed it. Awesome. Cool, other questions before we uh, jump into some of the attacks here, now that we, now that we all understand the, uh, the, the basics here. I think we're good, okay, good deal. All right, so let's talk through some of these attacks. So one of the first ones, this is, good, or sorry, one of the biggest ones is the golden ticket right in the uh shoot what is this stupid movie uh charlie charlie and chocolate factory right i was it always bothered me in charlie and the chocolate factory that the grandpa had been in bed for like 40 years and they jumps up and starts singing and dancing because that's what you would do if you never got out of bed but whatever so uh the golden ticket here remember that is the long-term key that T K R B T G T. That password hash, that is the long-term key used by the KDC. So what happens now is if we as the attacker can get access to that long-term key, the password hash for that KRB TGT, the whole thing starts to, starts to, to, to break down. Because now we can start to rewrite 
some of those tickets. I can now rewrite my pack and that can I can fix that second signature. Also, now my my ticket granting ticket, right? We can now rewrite some of that uh, as well. So here's sort of the flow if we use the golden ticket. So with the golden ticket, what I'm not gonna do is ask for a ticket granting ticket. I'm gonna skip that step and I'm just going to generate it myself. So I start now with a ticket granting ticket and we're gonna have some changes. What I'm gonna do here is I'll just make myself a domain admin, right? So now my path, so inside the ticket granting ticket actually is a copy of the path. Uh, and then what happens is when I use that ticket granting ticket, the, the main controller just says a copy paste, let's just use that. And then it will then use that pack, the one that I have now created. I have now forged my own driver's license. And now we can use that to access a wide range of systems. We can see here, for example, my ticket says here that I am a domain admin, right? That's gonna give me a lot of different access to a, a lot of systems, right? Very privileged access. So now what's of course special about the golden ticket? Well, of course, the obvious answer is, well, it's sort of homemade, right? We have skipped that first step. We'll talk in a little while, a little bit later about some of the detections and protections for some of this uh, as well. But now I've got a ticket that gives me access to everything. I've skipped that first step. I don't need the passwords for, for users. I can just now create ticket granting ticket at will or any account with all sorts of fake data if I so choose. By default, the tools are gonna to create these, again, by default, for 10 years. So, obvious detection is look for a ticket granting ticket that is 10 years of validation period. All right, how can we create this? Pretty straightforward. A number of different tools that can do this. I love me some uh, Kerberos, I mean, sorry, Mimikatz. So with Mimikatz, I generate my ticket granting ticket with this. So I'll say Kerberos Golden. I'm gonna give it the KRB TGT, the password hash for that particular account, and then all of the additional information. There's a question here I see off the side that says, does Kerberos not store the valid TGT? No, because that would be sort of redundant. What it does do is the domain controller can check the signature but because the signature is legitimate, because I created it using the correct key, everything then checks out, right? So once I create my ticket granting ticket, I'm going to load it with the PTT, put that into memory, start using that ticket, and now I can access all sorts of uh, systems. So that's the golden ticket. Let's talk now a little bit about the skeleton key. So if I, as an attacker, can get access to a domain controller, what I can do is I can shim out LSATs. So what this means is I now inject shellcode, inject code into the LSAS process and say, you know, when you check a password, why don't you check it the normal way? But why don't you also check my code as well? So if I log in with my password of, you know, summer 2020, because that's what I always use, it's gonna say, cool. And now if this is running, I could also log in with Tim with the password of Mimikatz. And I could log in with any user with the password of Mimikatz. So I could log in as BB, a domain admin, the SQL admin, whatever I want, because the domain controller that LSAS is now shimmed and there's additional code that says, cool, check the original, but also check the option here, right? The default is Mimikatz. Uh, change that default, be very careful with that. I had, I didn't, didn't get permission to ask beforehand. Well, yeah, I won't say it. Yeah, well, sure, Mubix, Rob, Rob Fuller, awesome guy, told me a story about, he was doing a pen test, went to log into the domain controller. He said, you know what, let's just try Mimikatz. He tried the password of Mimikatz and it worked. So what had happened is the previous pen testers had, Skeleton, skeleton keyed the domain controller, but they never cleaned up, which meant for that entire maybe year, anybody could have logged in to any account if they just used the password of a Mimikatz. Yeah, Face Palm is absolutely right. I see pickles. Yeah, definitely not good. 
So if you happen to use this on a pen test or a red team, make sure you clean up afterwards. I mean, all it requires is a simple reboot of the domain controller. So just bounce that thing up. So it does matter. So the question there is, does it matter which DC? Yes. I need to, if I put it on, let's say, let's say that there's 10 DCs and I put it on one, of course, my authentication request would have to hit DC1 for it to, uh, to work. If I hit DC2, the shim is not running, obviously would not work. All you have to do is just reboot that system. Yeah, I, I don't know how long that uptime was for that or what the timing was, but all I know is it worked for, uh, for Rob. Okay, so skeleton key, pretty straightforward. We load up again, my favorite tool, Mimikatz, and say misc skeleton. There is no option to, to set this, so you, to, you have to uh, recompile it. All right, let's talk through my favorite, <laughs> awesome gift, uh, my favorite Kerber hosting. This is a technique I came up with in 2014. So remember, if we go back to that whole process, right? When I authenticate and when I get to a service, first, I need a ticket granting ticket, right? So I'll authenticate to domain control. And I'll do that probably when I boot up first thing in the morning when I come in or whatever it, it may be, right? Then I'm going to ask the domain controller for a ticket for the service, right? So now I have the service ticket. So I've got that service ticket, remember, that service ticket is encrypted using the password hash of the target service. So what I could do here is now I have this ticket. It's encrypted using the password hash of the target service. I now, oops, sorry if that made a lot of noise. Um, I now have a way to start cracking, right? I have password material. So I'm gonna guess the password for the remote system after I have the ticket hash it, attempt to, to decrypt, and then rip a tail. Get a typo in there again, dang it. Um, lots of slides. So I'm gonna do this over and over again. The beautiful thing with this is this is now an offline attack, right? I request the ticket, I bring it back to my system, and now I can do an offline attack. Remember that the domain controller does not make the decision whether I have access to the service or not, right? That means I can request a ticket for anything. I can request a ticket for any service in the organization. It can be things I request uh, access to that I clearly don't have access to, right? Or don't have permissions to. Those systems could be firewalled off. They could be offline, broken. In fact, frankly, they could be taken out of the network. They could be take that system, Take it, send it to recycling and not be in the network as long as that SPN mapping still exists, I can request a ticket. Okay, so this, what this allows, it allows the attacker to reach really deep inside the organization, get these tickets for oftentimes very sensitive accounts and perform an offline password attack. I remember when I first sort of came up with this, uh, it took a while for people to figure it out and frankly me to explain it because it was so weirdly different, right? So let's talk now about the extraction and some of the, uh, the cracking, right? So I need to extract that ticket so I can do the cracking. Now, there's a number of different ways that we can extract, you know, Mimikatz it, 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 uh, supports this extraction. The problem is with Mimikatz, as much as I like it, some of the evasion can be a little bit difficult. There's Invoke Mimikatz. A number of the other different C2 frameworks have ability to do the same sort of thing where I can extract the tickets myself. Then we can do some of the, the cracking. And I'll show you a demo of that sort of in just a, a little bit. All right, so with our silver ticket here, remember, the ticket that the service sees is encrypted using the password hash of that account. So if I can get that password in some way, shape or form, or get that password hash, maybe by compromising a domain controller, maybe by compromising the target system, or maybe by Kerberos tip. Now I have that password hash. What I can do now is I can start forging the silver ticket. Let's take a look at the silver ticket once again. 
So my silver ticket, remember, when I receive a legitimate one, there's two pieces, right? There's a piece for me, and there's the piece I send to that remote system, right? The piece that I send to the remote system has those two signatures and the pack. The pack, of course, it's signed with those two signatures. It's encrypted, sorry, it's signed using the password hash of the target service. So we're double using that password hash for the remote system. It's once to encrypt the whole ticket and then again use for the signature, right? Now, of course, if I want to, to sign using KRB TGT, I would have to extract that or I can rely on the service not performing that secondary check. So I was gonna do a demo, but I was kind of curious on how this is gonna work over the internet and all that jazz. So instead, what I did is I did a demo and I just took a bunch of screenshots just to make sure that it worked okay. So here's an example. So this is my home domain here. So I've got my account here, right? Just, just Tim. So Medine Tim, I create my account. I'm sorry, look at my account. And this user is just a lowly domain user. This does not require local admin on the, the end user system. And it definitely doesn't require administrative access on the, the service side either. Uh, if, you know, bonus points if you do get ac access. Sorry, bonus points if the member server has admin rights because now you can use that, right? So we can see here, my user is just a regular domain user. My user is not one of the local administrators either. So just a regular old user on, the, on this box, right? Tacker is just a regular user. Number of different ways we can extract this. I uh, hear I just sort of truncated it a little bit for the sake of space. But in this case, I use the invoke, invoke Kerberos to extract the ticket. So here essentially is the ticket that I would get for that target service, right? So what's going on sort of in the background here, if I don't have a ticket granting ticket, I'll request one of those. I'll then send the ticket granting ticket oops, to the domain controller, the KDC and say, hey, I need a ticket for the SQL server. And then I end up with what you see on the screen here, right? On the screen here, you see that ticket. I can then crack that, right? Because this ticket, is encrypted using the password hash of that remote system. So there's a number of different crackers. Hashcat is by far my preferred option. Here's an example Hashcat command, very simplified. This isn't meant to be a Hashcat training exercise, but simple way to do this. Uh, John the Ripper will do also, also do this as well. I prefer Hashcat. Now, I wrote a cracker. I wrote a cracker 2014 when I came up with this because there wasn't anything else and I wrote it in Python and I was I, I knew it wasn't going to be as fast as C but I wasn't good enough to do to write all the C on my tight deadline so I wrote it with Python and I thought it would be a great idea to use the multi-core multi-processor support within Python with load additional module to make it go faster and it uh, did not there was an option in my cracker to add addition, to, to specify the number of threads. And then Ethan Robish at uh, uh, Black Hills tried it out. He's like, yeah, the optimal number of threads is one. So technically my code that meant to go make it go faster actually probably slowed it down. Now I still get <laughs> issue an issue request on GitHub for people to ask me to like update my cracker to Python 3. Don't use it. Use the hashcat. It's so much faster. All right. So let's say we do our cracking, right? So I've, I've got my cracked account, right? I've got this ticket here. I have cracked the password here for the, the SQL engine. And in my case, I picked a simple password of password one just to save time, right? So let's take a look at that target service account once we have successfully cracked it. So my target service here, this is a C, the SQL engine. This is just a regular domain user. This is a, a, a properly configured SQL server. You know, ideally from an attacker's perspective, and frankly, what we see way too often is we'll see an account like this that it has significant privileges or might be a domain admin even, 
In this case, I properly configured this server so it can register with a domain controller to register the SPN, but it has as minimal permissions as possible. Remember, we don't have to have local admin access on either the end user or that target service account, okay? So what happened is that is I've, 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 I've got this. Now, quick demo here is I'm gonna log in just using my regular account, my regular TM to the database server, right? I, I haven't done anything else yet and I don't have access, right? What I was trying to prove here is that this Tim account, my regular account does not have access to the database server, okay? So now let's generate a silver ticket, right? So I've cracked the password hash for, or password rather, for the remote service account, right? I've curb roasted it, got the ticket, cracked it, got the password, and now I've got the password hash for that remote system. Now within Mimikatz, I can generate a silver ticket. I know it says Kerberos colon colon golden. That's just the feature that we use within Mimikatz. It's still called golden, but we just provided a different hash. So what I'm gonna do, this is, this is sort of just creating a, a legitimate ticket, right? If I was gonna recreate my ticket here, we'll come back through a couple of these different pieces here. The, the key pieces to this ticket are gonna be the groups, the ID, and of course, the user. So let's change this a little bit, right? So let's change this. So I am me, but I'm also not me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave my user still as TM, as Tim, but I'm gonna change my ID, my RID, to be that of Bob. And now I'm gonna authenticate to the SQL Server. And here's what happens when I authenticate to the SQL Server. It lets me in. And now I can access Bob's secrets. So I can see that Bob's secrets database, things to do in the future, I need to buy some Brondo, uh, I need to get a time machine, right? Get a latte, cool. Typo on the ID, did I just spell something wrong? Uh, well, whatever. Now there's another set of tables that I don't have access to. I don't have access to the plans for world domination. So I, meaning Bob, does not have access to that. Let's see real quick, let's back up a little bit. What does it look like in the SQL server? So I'm gonna run a couple of SQL queries. First, I'm gonna get my name. Who does the server think I am? When I authenticate, what was the name that we, we gave to this? Well, we see, of course, TM. Now, what is the name of the SID, right? So this, this S user SID gets the SID, S user S name gets the name of that SID. And now we can see that the SID that the server thinks I am is actually Bob's. Weird, right? So I gave it my username, but Bob's RID, so it's authenticating me based on Bob's access. Cool, right? And we can take another step further. Let's add some additional groups. So I've got my groups here. I'm gonna add a couple of groups. I'm gonna add, I don't know, everything that has the word admins in it, right? Domain admins, enterprise admins, schema admins, admins, whatever, right? So now I generate this ticket and now I can access the plans for world domination, right? I can, I can now see these because I now have access as domain admin. Realistically, the domain admin is gonna have access to frankly everything, right? And again, if we look at the SID thing, remember here, I didn't change the SID in this case. I kept it as my own. So it still thinks that I'm Tim, but I have access, right? Weird, right? Tim now has access because of the additional sort of fake groups, if you will. Let's turn some troll mode on here, right? So what happens now if we change this just a little bit and we say, you know what, let's change our ID to something else and let's make the user your mom, right? So now I've got 9999 is my RID and the user is your mom. And I can access, because I can, we'll still get access to the database, right? I will still get access to the database because of those group memberships. But now my ID and user are different. And we can actually see this here. So if we look at the event log, we see the, uh, the, the, uh, the log on for your mom. Now imagine, I always laugh, like, 
imagine doing that as, as uh, incident response. You know, some executive walks in, so whose who's account was compromised? Um, I'm sorry, speak up. Uh, your, 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 your mom is the, uh, the account, right? And then the SID and everything is all sorts of broken. So, uh, you know, it's like generating your own driver's license here for my, uh, my McLovin, right? And it's got all of the, the barcodes and stuff and everything looks sort of cool, right? So that's Kerberos and a silver ticket. I wanted to go through that because I had a couple of questions afterwards from different people like, hey, can you give me a demo of that? Also, there was a misconception that the target service had to run as admin, and it does not. That's a key point here. It does not have to run as, uh, as admin. Other things we can do with Kerberos attacks is we can do pass the ticket. It sort of feels like not really an attack, but it is. I mean, you're just essentially taking someone's ticket and then reusing it, right? It's like grabbing the credit card out of mom's wallet and using it. It's the legitimate thing. I'm just not supposed to uh, to have it, right? So I can grab the ticket, export it with, uh, like for example, with Mimikatz to export the ticket, uh, import it into another system, and then use that to access other systems, right? So we're going to take that ticket granting ticket, dump it, put it someplace else, and then use that. We can also overpass the hash. So even if we disable L NTLM within the, with inside of our organization, we can still Remember that first authentication, let me jump ahead here. That first authentication, the thing that allows me into that network is on the is, is based on the NTLM hash. So I can still, even if NTLM is disabled everywhere else, that first request for all intents and purposes relies on it and I can still use that, right? All right, so let's, let's go through some of the, uh, the wrap up here. So we'll talk through when can we use these attacks and what are some of the uh, the defenses. Well, the golden ticket, this is used for persistence and pivoting. This is not an access mechanism. This does not get me into the network at first. This does not give me my initial access. I have to have control of a domain controller or that, that level of permissions to get that password hash so that I could potentially reuse it. Now, Kerberosting, this is a pivoting and escalation technique. You have to have access to the domain controller as some sort of authenticated user to request those tickets. Once you have those tickets, we can now crack those passwords, and then we could use that, those passwords and either use those credentials directly, or we could use a, a, a silver ticket, right? So a silver ticket is gonna be used for a persistence and our escalation, right? We saw that with the, the database server where I rewrote that ticket and now is able to access extra pieces on that target service, right? Pass the ticket and overpass the hash. We're gonna have access as a user and this is gonna be allowed, used for, uh, for pivoting, not an escalation technique. Now, here's a number of great posts that I recommend reading. We don't necessarily post them all in chat because there's a ton of them, but, Will Schroeder Harmjoy did a, uh, a presentation maybe a week and a half or two weeks ago. Phenomenal, fantastic, on Kerberos revisiting. And he talked about Rebus, Rubus, can't pronounce it right, Rubius, whatever. His tool here, that thing is amazing. Holy crap. Uh, thank you to, to him and the rest of the people that worked on it. It's mostly just Will. Phenomenal, phenomenal tool. Check that out if you're an offensive person. You've got to get uh, your hands on this tool. In fact, we're working on it right now to add this into uh, 560. And frankly, literally any reading, anything from Sean Metcalf, it's funny, I, I saw Sean in New York a couple of years ago and we, we were talking and somehow Kerberos came up because it always does, whatever. And I was like, you know what, Sean? I, 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 people ask me all the time, like, How, can you explain Kerberos to me? And I told Sean, I'm like, I just, Forward them to your blog post because it's way better than anything I could have written because you do such a great and thorough job. And he told me back, he's like, well, honestly, I write those blog posts to help me understand because I don't necessarily understand it up front and that helps me solidify it. Just like, oh, that's really freaking cool. By the way, call out to all of you watching at home, write blog posts on stuff. Even if, you, if it's already out there, even if it's not like the latest and greatest tool, it helps you learn it and it helps you hopefully 
let somebody else learn it. Get your, your, get your spin on it too as well. Frankly, it's also good for job hunt stuff type, type uh, thing too. Hey, look, I blogged, I'm good, I'm smart, right? All right, so some of the defenses. The key here for most of this is going to be monitoring, right? The, the, the golden ticket, I mean, the, the obvious answer is, well, don't get owned. Great, right? Realistically, that might happen, right? So the key here, this is a little bit tougher. So look for things where like, hey, why is my ticket granting ticket all of a sudden 10 hours, right? Or sorry, 10 years. That's, that's funky. Something weird there, right? Not the, the best, not, the, not the best idea, right? That's not going to be a default. That shows you that a tool is, is generating this. And as I mentioned, the, 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 by default, it's going to be significantly less. So look for a shorter ticket granting ticket. If you see the long one, there's other tools that will look for use of ticket granting tickets where the ticket granting ticket was never generated and never requested in the first place. That's going to take some extra tooling to uh, to do that. There are some tools out there that will do this. I haven't necessarily run up against any of those, but they are sort of out there. Curb roasting, the big thing here is going to be looking for too many ticket requests. If all of a sudden you've got one user on your network that is requesting tickets over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, that's a problem, right? Related to that, if Steve in marketing or Sally in accounting is all of a sudden requesting a single ticket, right? That single ticket can be much lower, much, much slower. It's still out of, right? That's not normal, right? Understand your baseline. Why all of a sudden are they requesting tickets for this thing if they've never done that before? Another great one, use honey tickets. In fact, Will talks about this in his talk, sort of ways around this. In fact, what he'll do, because Sean was one of the first people to come up with the idea of the honey tickets, is he won't roast any accounts that are newer than Sean's blog post, right? Because if that password hasn't been changed since then or created since then, we know probably that it's, it, it's, it's good and it's not used. But, and by honey tickets, what I mean is you'll create an account that's used for nothing. You'll set the SPN and you'll alert Anytime someone requests a ticket for that, right? Because there's no valid reason why anyone inside your network should be requesting that, uh, that ticket. So a single request for that ticket means something has gone uh, wrong, right? A silver ticket, again, monitoring, you'd have to keep an eye up for a missing uh, request for ticket. Again, it can be a little bit more difficult to, uh, to pull that up. All right, so that is going to, uh, to wrap it up. So we have, let's see, hopefully there's some more questions here. I see CJ coming back online. Good luck. We got a lot of tickets. So feel free to say pass on these because I'm just going to work from the bottom coming back up. Oh, uh, boy. How many requests are too many requests, Tim? How many requests are too many requests? I mean, that's going to be completely dependent on the tuning of the defensive systems. I've heard that, I mean, one's obviously going to be too low. I've heard two, because sometimes I'll request two in a row. I've heard three is where we can start getting into better detection. So if someone within a certain time frame requests three Kerberos tickets, something funky is probably going on. And again, I, as the attacker, could just slow down and say, hey, I just want one, right? So it's going to be much, much harder. Is there a specific way to identify? There's a lot of defensive questions out there. You could probably do a whole, whole show on that. Is there a way to identify golden ticket using the Microsoft event IDs? I don't know the answer to that. Cool. This one's pretty theoretical. How does Kerberos work in a zero trust environment? You've got to be at a at an environment where you're trusting the domain controller and the well, I mean, KDC. Yeah, I mean the, the the whole thing is that you zero trust means zero trust. It means you just trust certain things less than other things. I mean, you still have to have the authentication, right? You still trust your domain controller. You're just not going to allow random connections in. That's a maybe that ooh, that'd be a good topic for a whole sort of a podcast. <laughs> Down the rabbit hole, Tim. Exactly. 
Uh, why doesn't Microsoft just use the MIT implementation of Kerberos? The reason why we don't use the MIT implementation is ease of implementation, right? In the domain, the, everyone has a password. It's already there. To use it otherwise, you'd have to generate a, a secret random value for everybody and then somehow distribute that and separate it from the account. And, and now that just becomes a pain, right? So it, it, it's, it's non-trivial, whereas the Kerberos, you just, we didn't have it, and then the next day we did, and we didn't even know that we had it. Is it reasonable to change the password for KRPDGT on a periodic basis? That's a great question. So, one of the, if if an attacker has your KRB TGT, and we they can generate those golden tickets, right? The defense is what you ultimately are going to have to do is rotate that password. And if you do it too fast, you will break the entirety of the domain in an epic, epic fashion. So you have to rotate, you actually have to rotate it twice because the current password and the last password are actually both still valid keys. So you have to rotate it twice. And again, you do it too fast, you break everything. I don't know if there's benefit to like rotate it every day just cause. I mean, if there's an attacker in and they, they sort of detect those changes, they'll probably just grab it anyway. And if you're not detecting the attacker in the first place, they're just gonna keep grabbing it over and over again. So I don't know if there's a tremendous value in that. And if you have a problem where a system is offline for let's say two days and you rotate every day, that system's gonna come up and it's dead. So nice. maybe you do that like once a week, once a month, but again, I don't, I don't know the, the value proposition. You kind of have to experiment and see, and it probably depends on the environment to some extent. Yeah. Apologies if you answer these because I could only half listen because I was answering questions. Sure. Mimi cats are detected by endpoints in AV. Is there another way around to generate a golden ticket? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a lot of your C2 frameworks will do the same sorts of things. I just picked Mimi cats because that was the the, the the tool I had there. So, I mean, I, I, the short answer is there's a ton of them out there. Pretty much every single C2 framework has something like that built in. There's another question that I wanted to get to, and I forgot to mention this too. A defense for Kerberos is obviously a good long password that's not crackable. Related to that, ideally use like managed service accounts so they are truly random passwords and they are automatically generated. And that, that makes this pretty much infeasible. Yes. There were all sorts of questions about picking of RC4, AES, does one, does it make a difference for which one's more defensible? How do you select that? Yeah, so this, this is one of the things that Harmjoy was, was talking about is there's still ways, even if you've got, you, you've turned off RC4 in your environment and say AES only, where you can force it to downgrade. From an attacker's perspective, it, it doesn't necessarily matter because I can still do the crack the same way. It just means it's orders of magnitude slower to do the, the cracking with AES versus RC4. Uh, also, look for, and again, it's not a perfect detection. You're gonna have to tune this, but look for those requests for RC4. But again, you're gonna by default still have RC4 even if you disable RC4 because of the way that Microsoft oh, and Windows makes choices. Right. Again, watch Will's presentation. He goes through the details. Nice. Now we're getting very close to the end here. Any other protocols of authentication? Are there alternatives to Kerberos? I mean, the Windows domain, not really. I mean, that's the whole point of the Windows domain is you get the single sign-on, you've got the single central nervous system and brain that allows you to do all that, you know, quote unquote, simply, right? So that a single sign-on is fantastic for usability, but it also means one piece is compromised and the whole thing crumbles. So and there's always pluses and minuses. We only got one minute left. I need Jason to come on and wrap this up, I'm afraid. The, 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 it, 1. 2,000 something people and still 1,800 generated a ton of questions, ton of good ones. Sorry we couldn't get them to all, all of them, sorry. Absolutely, thank you so much for joining us here for this Black Hills Information Security webcast. We do these weekly. If this is your first time here, we have a Discord channel. Follow that, it's easier to, to have a conversation and discuss that way. And we keep that going all the time. So here comes my daughter to show me some artwork that she did uh, working from home. Tim, thanks so much for being here from Red Siege Information Security. 
we are pen testers. So if you ever need a pen test, Susie. Hey, sweetheart. Like all right, yeah, I'll tell you all about <laughs> it in a second. <laughs> You guys can identify. This is the world of uh, the coronavirus, right? Oh, Everyone's yeah. experiencing this. It's not unusual, Jason. Uh, my kid came yeah. in. I was on a Zoom call. My kid came in to give me the tabs for notes on paper. Yeah. I, I have no paper on my desk. I haven't used one of these in a decade, but somehow I needed it in the middle of my Zoom call this morning. Yeah. I have a highlighter for you, Tim, if you need it. Yeah. So if you, you need a. a... Anyway? <laughs> Sorry, Jason. You, Sorry, Jason. We've, uh, we've jumped the shark. <laughs> 